Good afternoon. My name is Michael Smith. I'm a Vice President of Social Innovation at the Case Foundation. Uh, we are so delighted to have such an incredibly full crowd here today. As uh, Steve and I were walking over, we saw people eating outside on the streets and also just commenting about how there was a snowball fight here just two weeks ago and now people are eating lunch. So thank you for coming inside and being here for this panel today. Um, you know, we at the Case Foundation are so incredibly proud to be a co-sponsor with our friends at the Aspen Institute of this panel today, not only because we're such fans of the folks that are gathered on the stage, because, but because we also believe in the power of social innovation. Um, at the Case Foundation, we've been investing in civic engagement since we launched in 1997. Uh, trying to look at investing in people and ideas that can change the world, but really looking at civic engagement at the heart of everything that we do. Because we think if you can create an active and engaged community, then an active and engaged community that creates an active and engaged citizenry, then that citizenry will produce the types of innovations and innovators that can solve myriad problems. You know, while the nonprofit sector is working admirably at clothing those that are cold and feeding those that are hungry. When you have effective social innovators, they are looking to embrace new approaches and new tools that can solve problems that we otherwise thought were unsolvable. Um, I'm also happy today to bring welcome from our CEO, Jean Case, who could not be here today, but sends her regards, and also from our chairman, Steve Case, who is here, and somehow he's sitting here and I'm standing up here, and I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry for that, <laughs> but he says hello. Um, I am also, also just delighted to introduce the moderator of today's panel so I can step out of the way and we can start hearing about the game changers and how they're changing the game. Our moderator of today's panel is... I think, as all of you know, a skillful and masterful storyteller. Uh, he is a master of media. Um, but I think I've, I've gotten to know Walter over the past couple of years. What I have come to like the best and admire the best about him is he is someone that is an, an energetic thinker and a doer, whether it's the work that he does in New Orleans or in the West Bank community of Nablus. So I'm happy to introduce the CEO of Aspen Institute, Walter Isaacson. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all right. Uh, Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Steve. This all originated when Steve and Michael and uh, Mayor Goldsmith and we were all down in Texas at an event that Sonal was at as well, the uh, president announcing uh, some thoughts on social innovation, giving a great speech. And on the way back, we were talking about Steve's book and said, well, let's, uh, let's engage our community here on this. Uh, as most of you know, Mayor Stephen Goldsmith is a professor at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. He's the author of this great book, which is The Power of Social Innovation. Uh, our friends at Politics and Prose have it for sale outside right there. He was an advisor to President George W. Bush on uh, faith-based and not-for-profit initiatives. Uh, and most famously, um, he was a two-term mayor of Indianapolis that totally revital revived uh, how services are delivered uh, and uh, has continued to uh, think through that process. Sonal Shaw is Deputy Assistant to the President and the Director of the uh, White House Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation. Uh, she has many distinctions. She was uh, at, led Google.org's um, global engagement, uh, was at Goldman Sachs for many years, but at least in this room, one of your highest distinctions is your Henry Crown Fellow of the Aspen <laughs> Institute, uh, of which we're very proud. Let me start with you, Mr. Mayor. Tell me what social innovation and social entrepreneurship really means. Well, you know, I've been, uh, I've been uh, at this for a few years and did about 100 interviews, and at the end of it decided I wasn't actually sure what it meant. <laughs> so, uh, it's probably not the way, uh, the degree of precision you're supposed to start with. but. I mean, basically, we wanted to look at were uh, creative leaders who had a kind of a sense of passion about social change, uh, and that passion is generally connected to performance. Uh, it's connected to a new approach to uh, an existing social, previously thought to be intractable problem. In the book, we've we I've kind of altered the definition in this way, though, because the the social entrepreneurship movement, the social innovators, generally we think of them as the uh, John Gompertz of the world, right, the folks that are here, Bill Milken, people who start nonprofits. I actually think t in the book that you can find civic entrepreneurship from any number of positions, right? You can have uh, public officials who are responsible for social entrepreneurship. You can have 
obviously nonprofit leaders, or um, as uh, the case of um, as the situation you can find with uh, philanthropists, there might be a passionate philanthropist who wants to drive social change. So we've looked at passionate leaders, performance driven, also thinking about social change in terms of systems, right? Not just a one one off program, but an intervention that actually changes the lives for a significant number of people. Sonal, is the Office of Social Innovation new at the White House? It is. Uh, it, it's new, but it's building upon, I think, what other administrations have done. So it started off with um, Office of Service with President, the first President Bush, then President Clinton set up the Corporation for National and Community Service. Which, by the way, Stephen Goldsmith is the is chairman of. Yeah. I forgot to put that as the introduction. And, uh, and then uh, pres the second President Bush created the Office of uh, faith-based, uh, and then, the, and then uh, that group kind of carried on a lot of the social innovation pieces, and I think this is just the next generation of that movement. I think that's been growing, and I think what we're beginning to see is the idea of social innovation, social entrepreneurship, while it has, we've talked about it in our circles, it's beginning to become a conversation at many levels, at state levels, at local levels, but within communities and saying how do we start solving problems and what is it that we can do to solve these problems and I think that is kind of the culmination of this office of saying there are different ways of looking at solving social problems and why this office is um, a good part of that is that we're beginning to think about it throughout government. It's not just that this office exists, mm -hmm. it's that we're looking at HHS, we're talking to HUD, we're at the Corporation for National and Community Service, Education, Arnie Duncan's doing a lot of this within, within the agency, the Department of Education. So it's beginning to become a process by which agencies are looking at this and the way the government is thinking how we can operate differently. What does your fund do? Explain your fund. The Social Innovation Fund is located at the Corporation for National and Community Service. It's $50 million. And I think the, the important parts of the fund are two main things. One, we're not, we are looking to fund intermediaries who are going to go find the best ideas in communities. The government sometimes is not the best at going in and saying what's happening in Indianapolis or what's happening in, in um, Houston or what's happening in, in New Orleans, but there are intermediaries who can do that. So we're going to invest in those <coughs> intermediaries who will then make an investment in organizations to help um, replicate programs, to help grow programs, to build the infrastructure for programs to have greater impact. But that fund, and what the fund has done is it's gotten, it's galvanized the Department of Labor, the Department of Education, the Department of Housing and Urban Development to think about how they might create similar funds mm -hmm. to do similar types of things through their agencies. But, and the important thing about the Social Innovation Fund is we're not tied to an agency, it's tied across the board. So we can we could invest in a housing program, we could invest in an education program, we could invest in a healthcare program, and that allows us to find the best ideas out there in community. How is it peer reviewed? Well, I mean, it, 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 actually, that's. And how should it be peer reviewed? Yeah, that's a simple question, that's about, about 10 aspects to it. <laughs> um, so, I mean, we've got that, we have this approach, right, that, that suggests that there is a, a way that government can be part of the solution. And to some extent, government is the problem and the solution, right? Because if, if, you, if, you're, uh, if you're in the private marketplace, you want a new product, right? You go buy the product. In the, in the world of in social innovation, there is no marketplace because most consumers don't have choices because they get their services from an agency or through government funding. So it's very difficult for a good idea to spread. And for every problem we have, you know, and everybody in the room knows that the situation in cities generally today is really quite bad, right? Income disparity is up and poverty is more concentrated and high school graduation rates are, are dismal and it feels really bad. But for each one of those problems, there is a social innovator somewhere who has a solution and has demonstrated the solution. It just never grows, right? So, and government keeps funding, and, and it's not a, a complaint about uh, the, the Bush administration or the Obama administration or the Goldsmith Indianapolis administration, just the habits of government uh, are to fund the same activities year after year. When I was mayor, um, it felt to me like, and I had this argument with my local United Way, right? So my, you have a well-intentioned agency with a well-intentioned board that would do a well-intentioned activity and not really create any value. And that earned them the right to ask for more money because inevitably the argument was they, didn't, they weren't creating value because they didn't have enough money, right? So, so now the goal of, and, and everybody actually thought it, the goal of this innovation fund to be, to be um, impactful has to say we are venture capital that's designed to prove that these activities can go to scale. So therefore, the risk here is that if it's just another 
it's, it's only it's only fifty million dollars, right? And this, this is a big government, and that means the money has to be spent really well. And traditionally, and and, and our corporation, National Community Service, does just just like every other federal agency. We set up these peer review processes. They're very static. They're very prescriptive. They're very rule driven, and they're designed to make sure that we don't make any mistakes. Well, the, uh, I don't know how many of you have been involved with venture funds, but the chances of 100% success in your venture fund means that you haven't really invested it very well to begin with. So um, I'm hoping that the fund will be able to take some risk and find some, uh, some um, uh, good examples. Last comment, though. I'm the Corporation Asking Community Service Chairman, so I essentially work for Sono in my volunteer world. So here's essentially how this, will, how this works. Okay, Goldsmith, here's $50 million, and we, we hope that you're successful 50% of the time. So we just go up to Congress and say, Hey, Congress, we failed only half the time. This is a terrific success, right? So <laughs> She's there setting is, you up. <laughs> yeah, there's a little tension here in the way we're going about it. Yeah. Well, I, I would just I, I'd add to that, and I'm not, you know, we're not involved in the peer review process, but I think, I think the important thing here is we need to look for those impactful organizations that are going to have transformative changes. So if, if we look and start looking at only looking for marginal changes, mm -hmm. that's not going to be the success of the fund. We have to look at the ones that have transformational opportunities, ones that if that spread to another city or to another town, that is going to have a huge impact in the outcome of you know, high school graduation or more, uh, more families getting preventive health care. Whatever it is, we've got to start addressing those, uh, those questions. And second, I think we need to start looking at um, peer reviewing as we tend to look at only the programs and the way foundations work, and certainly when I was at a foundation, we looked at, okay, how much more can I grow the program? But it, sometimes to grow the impact of an organization requires investment on in the management team. Mm -hmm. Can the management team expand so they can do much more? Mm -hmm. And I think investing in the people is just as important as investing in the organization. And I think that sometimes we don't think about that as part of growth. Give me some examples of the things that have worked like that. I mean, good local organizations that had impact, as you said. You know, there are, there are um, I've been lucky enough in the last probably month, two, three months really, to go out or go around the country and visit different mm -hmm. organizations. So I uh, went to one in New Hampshire where um, a woman by the name of Maureen Beauregard is, was herself homeless and has created a homeless <coughs> shelter. But that's not just a homeless shelter. It is a new way for families to come together to find a way to be, come out of homelessness. But they give, get job training at the same time, and they're able to transition people out within six to nine months. If, however, they fall back in, they have a place to come to because there's a family space. It's not just for you can only. It's not that you can only stay for a little bit of time. I went to go visit a place in California um, where a community, the, the Latino community, has come together uh, to to create a center where all of small businesses can operate under one shelter, and they get training along the way. So they figure out how to start a business. They they train each other, and they're doing healthy eating at the same time. So they're training the community there. So not only are they giving <coughs> entrepreneurship training but they're giving healthcare training and they're giving education training and so they're using that space effectively to do that. You look in, in, in New York, you look at Jeff Canada's organization and what Jeff's been doing and although he himself doesn't want to scale Harlem's Children's Zone to Chicago and other places, the government is taking the idea of Promise Neighborhoods and what's worked for him and trying to grow that across cities. So there are places we just need to get those factors of like what is it that makes Harlem's Children's Zone work and how do we replicate it in other so, so, so just real quickly, so those are terrific examples and hopefully we can find those with the fund. Another way to think about the answer to your question, not inconsistent but consistently, is um, I don't think we can create enough social change just by growing programs, exactly. right? So, I mean, you, you have two interesting examples in the room with uh, Mar Marguerite Kondracki and America's Promise over here and Bill Milken and Communities yeah. and Skills over there. And I only mention them because in both of those circumstances, they have taken a set of existing assets, right, and created and integrated and networked those assets, right, bringing them into the school in Bill's circumstances or, or going out for uh, the dropout summits in Marguerite's and said that our intervention is an intervention that, that produces value throughout the rest of the system that was previously fragmented. So, so you could identify a program like Sonal did, you could identify a program uh, in terms of integration, or I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll, we'll find uh, social investors, right, you have uh, social investment programs around the country where active uh, philanthropists uh, <coughs> participate with the organization, provide the management talent, uh, as you would do with a, with a traditional venture capital organization. So lots of different models of social change that this could prompt. 
I have a bit of a conflict of interest in this question, which I happen to be chair of the board of Teach for America. And one problem I sometimes have with the push for social innovation is that it's always let's invent something new rather than that second step of saying what's worked in 50 communities around this country and let's bring it to scale more. And so there's always this push to reinvent the wheel. How, how do you prevent that from happening when somebody says, well, I want to try it a totally different way as opposed to let's move things to scale? Look at me? Yeah. Um. <laughs> well, I assume we're not applying to the fund, so this is not a pitch. Uh, no, I don't think so. We can't. Uh, yeah. The corporation actually, it's an interesting example because corporation actually, the TFA uh, members are AmeriCorps members, but we can't keep up with their growth. This is a really good example, right? They have a really creative program. Wendy's a really terrific person, has done a lot of good. You know, you're ramping up at a, at a rate that we can't keep up with, right? And so, so it does raise the following issue that the way that Sonal and the president will really prove their worth is if these other departments repurpose existing funds and make them more available. I mean, you can think about what you're doing with Wendy is, right? You're, you're kind Wendy Cop is the Wendy we're I'm talking sorry. about who founded Teach for America. So you're coming in kind of from the side, and you can't grow to scale just with philanthropy without causing some repurposing of the, of the existing dollars. So it's a little complicated. I've tried to, I started this process thinking that social entrepreneur meant small good idea. But there's a lot of really interesting entrepreneurs that are not so small, you know, and, and TFA is a, regu is a pretty good size. Another example is, uh, you know, Michael Lomax, the United Negro College Fund, basically took over an organization, a highly esteemed organization, kind of looked at it for a while and said, you know, if our, if our mission is to help uh, uh, historically black colleges, uh, that's a little narrow, so let's, let's help black kids in black colleges. And then he looked at that a little bit longer and said, well, wait a minute, if the pipeline for African-American males, uh, African-Americans generally, males in particular, in the college is so broken that they can't get there in the first place, then the United Negro College Fund needs to have a new mission. The mission needs to help fix the pipeline of K-12, right? So, so he's a social entrepreneur. It's a historic organization with a legacy past, but now that's been transformed around the issues of public value. So I don't think... Uh, I don't think we would be looking only at new stuff as part of this effort. So, uh, no, absolutely. And I think what you raised with TFA is a co conversation I think we have a lot, which mm -hmm. is, is it just about the new organizations or is it about organizations that are effective and can grow? And I think it's, it's about both. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, we need new ideas where things aren't working and we're not achieving results. In other places, it's taking a good idea and growing it. And TFA is a good idea that needs to grow. Um, and should grow, and I think as long as it continues to show results, that's, that's, that's what we need to move towards. And I think our goal is results, mm -hmm. and our goal is effectiveness, and can we start making um, changes in social outcomes by the way we begin to support organizations. Tell me how all this works in the White House. Um, the President's own commitment, uh, Michelle Obama's commitment, I think Melody is involved, the Domestic Policy Council. What drives this? Um, all levels. So we've got uh, we've got the president and first lady. We've got Michelle. Um, I mean Michelle Joel. I'm sorry. Um, Melody Barnes. We've got Valerie Jarrett. Um, we have kind of across the board. I think everybody is interested in the in the idea of social innovation. I think we've got to prove that things are working. I think the social innovation fund is an important one. I think the I3 fund is going to be important to show that it can work. Um, I'm sorry, explain the I, the I3. The I3 fund is an innovation fund at the Department of Education. Mm. It's $650 million. That's, yeah, that's and the big one. Yeah. That, that has three parts where the first part of the fund invests in um, I innovative ideas that have potential for impact. The second part is ideas that have proven themselves that need to be replicated. And the third part is proven ideas that can scale. Mm -hmm. And that, that is the largest amount of money. I think the minimum in the last pot is $50 million as a start. Um, and then the middle, uh, the first two have, have quite a bit <coughs> less money. But the, the point here is I think the idea of social innovation and the need to make changes, social impact, is, uh, is, throughout, is interspersed throughout government. And we're constantly being asked, you know, where should we be doing, what should we be doing differently? So we have, uh, just recently, we've been talking to the Department of Housing and Urban Development with Sean Donovan on how HUD might think about this differently. Um, we've been talking to Labor about how they might think about innovation funds within their own agencies and what they could do. Now, they're talking repurposing money. They're not even talking about new money. So it is, it is what Steve was saying, which is when we start repurposing money to programs that are having impact, it's, gonna, it's where we begin to see the change in government. 
So there's the White House, there's also the agencies, they're hearing what the White House is interested in, and they're beginning to make uh, those changes. More importantly, we're also beginning to hear from, uh, from governors and mayors of their interest, and which is, I think, the other thing that we would like to get to, which is how do we build the infrastructure to work across layers of government, not just at the federal level. In your book, Stephen, you have a part about cautioning about government engagement. Yes. Um, I mean, this is kind of the, what do you do when you catch the bus, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, um, it's very complicated. Um, I mean, if you, uh, so government tends to be uh, appropriately prescriptive and demanding of accountability. Um, and that means it's telling its partners what it expects. So we're trying to move here from a situation where there is a uh, you know, request for a proposal and a series of kind of activities to one that says, okay, here's some innovation capital, give us your idea, and if it works, they'll be funding, and if it doesn't, see you later, right? Now, this, this is not typically the way things work because government, you know, government contract managers watch the organization, and then also if it fails, it tends to be protected by the legislative or executive process and never goes away. Um, so the goal here will be to try to create a part, uh, government partnership that is respectful of the process and model designed by the partner, holds them accountable for results, and then gets off their back in day-to-day -day activities. But this is not typical government conduct. So uh, there is a little bit of a, of a issue here. It's the same issue we had in the faith base. It's not exactly the same because of the First Amendment issues, but it's pretty close to the same you know, pushback we got from a number of faith-based organizations, not from, not from the folks concerned about the First Amendment, which is a separate issue, but from the faith organizations themselves, which are going, are you kidding me? We don't want to get tangled up with government. Well, especially, for example, here in this town, I think it was the faith-based and Catholic organizations and the question of civil unions and gay right. marriages. And so you get tangled it's up with government yeah. uh, regulations. So, no, how does one, I mean, there are probably people in this room who might want to apply now. What is the application process and what would you recommend uh, uh, be the driving force of your application? So I will make no recommendations on the application process, <laughs> but um, the fund is, it's online at the Corporation for National and Community Services website, which I believe is www.cncs.gov. And it, um, it is, it, it's, up, it's listed up there, it's got all the requirements for what the fund is, and I uh, would urge anyone that is interested in applying to it to please apply. The application process, I believe, is open for another two weeks. Um, and, uh, and then we'll be reviewing applications and hopefully announce it in June. A uh, last question before I open it up, which is in your book you also talk about open sourcing, something I think you did in Indianapolis, something that in some ways uh, the DNA of Google infused into Google.org. So it's, explain open sourcing, then I'll ask Sonal to talk about it. Well, we have a, um, <clears throat> we have a number of obstacles that uh, stand in the way of kind of social progress, right? So um, one is the market scale, which I talked about a minute ago. Another is that a government, for the best of intentions, tends to prescribe rules about who can participate in delivering a service. Um, you know, do you need a MSW to do a certain activity? Do you need a particular type of credential to teach science in a, in a grade school? And you can fill in the blank. There's a lot of these. And government has a responsibility for health and safety, so it, the fact that it's credentialing, licensing, and restricting is not irrational. But what it tends to do over time is act as a barrier to entry. So if you have a good idea and you're not on this side of the line, you can't get to this side of the line. And so, so and then the other th other uh, comment, just a um, slightly more provocative that we mentioned briefly in the book, is there is this kind of curse of professionalism, which says, look, I got trained in a set of professional skills, and, I, and I'm highly proficient in those professional skills, and so societal problems look to me like this is a hammer and the nail, that they ought to fit into my set of professional skills. But they don't really respond to the uh, very well. They're not very dynamic with respect to the needs of the person you're trying to help, right? And then they tend to be a little bit too patronizing and the like. So we're suggesting that, A, there needs to be more customer participation, client participation, client choice, client feedback. There needs to be fewer barriers to entry into a local market. It could be barriers to entry for the workers themselves or barriers to entry for the organizations because they're in, in many of the cities, including my own, 
you have a you have a community foundation, a United Way Allocations Committee, and, and a set of nonprofits, and some really good business leaders that sit on the boards of all of those, often on more than one of those. And so there tends to be um, a kind of an iron triangle, to borrow a Washington phrase, of funding in those organizations. So we're trying to look at more open sourcing on the demand side, more open sourcing on the supply side to create a marketplace for ideas. And real quickly, by doing all that, as chair of the Corporation for National Service, your traditional activities have been AmeriCorps, uh, used to be called VISTA, Vista mm -hmm. or VISTA is still a part of it. Yeah. Are you downplaying those? Well, um, no. Um, thanks for asking. So, uh, I do have a I do have an institutional role here. I should do. Um, so, uh, no. And I actually think that there is a risk here that your question is very helpful in addressing. That you know, we have a service movement that is really hot right now. Right, the president is, speaks with it passionately. The first lady kind of grew up in it. We have a millennial population that has a, a very substantial interest in participating in community national service. All very good. Right. Um, and then we have, the, and you have the Kennedy Hatch Act that I assume. Yeah, and we have uh, one of the few bipartisan uh, pieces of legislation that passed that dramatically increases the number of AmeriCorps members, uh, uh, eventually up to 250,000 from the 75,000 that, that uh, President Bush left it, which is up from 50,000 from President Clinton. But um, the the, um, uh, the there's an artificial divide here between social, often between the conversation about social entrepreneurship and service, and so. Um, one can think about a social entrepreneur as a person who harnesses the power of that service and directs it towards a social need, right? So, you gotta, so one of the problems we have is we have a, a large number of people who want to participate. They don't really want to participate, particularly the millennials, in the traditional way, right? That they go to one organization and that's their source of their volunteers. They're, they're, in the last census, the area that was up, the only area that was up substantially with respect to service were kind of ad hoc neighborhood relationships, mm -hmm. like get together to do X. So what we need to do is, is use the social entrepreneur to connect, to build a pipeline between this <coughs> reservoir of people who want to do good deeds and this uh, a, a number of folks who need the good deeds, and then train them, match them, and work them. And you know, and John's doing this with uh, Experience Corps with, uh, with uh, you know, right. young, with uh, young retirees. So. Um, a lot of opportunity. I like to keep the two conversations together, though they tend to kind of split apart. Well, the reason they are so important together is after Katrina hit New Orleans, one problem we had was so many people in this country wanted to go down and help, and there was so little capacity mm -hmm. to say, "All right, drive down, go to Lake, uh, go to Gentilly, find that church, and bring a hammer and nails." I mean, that's a very mm -hmm. complicated thing. People were saying, "Oh, we could use Google Groups to do that." Well, no, you can't. You need a real pipeline of saying, I want to join Habitat for Humanity, I want to join some organization. AmeriCorps was our, our savior, our lifeboat. Okay. And AmeriCorps is one that saved New Orleans by having real people there who knew how to get that involvement channeled. So I'd hate to lose that notion of service being channeled properly uh, in sort of this new idea of social entrepreneurship. Sonal? No, I... Um I think sometimes we tend to want to replace technology with people. And I think technology is as good as understanding what people want. And we don't always look at we don't always look at kind of what is the marketplace and what's going on in the marketplace and then design the technology to meet that need, but we keep wanting to push it. We'll use Google Groups to organize, but you still need a person there who knows what's going on to be able to say this is what the organization needs to do. And I think that just from the campaign side, I think that's something that worked very well on the campaign, which is we knew what people wanted and then developed the technology to meet that need, not necessarily um, the other way around. A couple of things um, that I think you had asked about the open source idea. I, th I think the open source, and, I, and Steve's book points it out really well, is open source is important to get ideas in as well as then being able to take those ideas and do something with it. Um, and I, I, and I, we need to build that infrastructure within government to be able to do that. But I think we need to build the infrastructure within the community to say how do we take in ideas um, and see what's working across the board. Sometimes we all know amongst ourselves what works, but we don't always share across Across the you know across the board that something here is working and you know something here could be be done differently and I'll give you one example of this <coughs> is El Paso and McAllen Texas um, McAllen and El Paso have about the same um, have about the same demographics 
yet one has addressed obesity and the other hasn't. And the two mayors have not even talked to each other about how they've done things because El Paso has managed to manage obesity and McAllen hasn't. They have the highest, one of the highest rates of obesity. How come those two mayors, even in the same state, don't know what's happening and what the, have they been able to address some of those mm -hmm. issues and how do we create open source or other types of applications that allow us to share information um, across the board. And then second, on, this, uh, on service, I, I, don't, I, I don't think we could emphasize enough why people are important. <laughs> Like training, and I, when I was in, when I was in both at Goldman and at Google, I was always looking to hire people who could go into some a situation and figure out how to solve the problem. What you know, the ambiguity matters a lot to some extent. Um, in Google, you'd have to go through almost 30 interviews before you even got hired, and all people wanted to know was were you created enough to solve a problem. And if you weren't, you generally didn't get hired. And at Goldman, it was the same. We were always looking for, can you work? If you didn't have an exact job description, could you make it happen, even though there's a job description there? And I think what AmeriCorps trains people to do is it trains you how to think. Right. And it trains you how to solve a problem. And I don't think we translate that enough sometimes. TFA has done it actually very well with businesses. I know, I know both at Goldman and Google, we hired a lot of TFA alums. But I, I, I wonder, you know, I think we need to translate why service matters. It's not just that you've done service for a year or two years, but it's that what your skills are are actually very transferable. Yeah, that's what I was trying to uh, imply, is that in the push for social innovation, Let's not forget AmeriCorps, Teach for America, and other places where people do service and they actually do learn a lot and are trained a lot and it uh, works well. If you're going to do a commercial, you probably at least ought to say that your other partner here, uh, Case Foundation, is, yeah. is the leader in using exactly. Web 2.0 tools to generate this service demand and kind of connect, connect it to meaningful mm -hmm. outcomes. A lot that, of yeah, yeah. One of the things the Case Foundation does particularly well is connectivity. In other words, those mayors would have been connected if the Case Foundation had been on uh, in Texas. Of course, you're from Texas, Michael, so you have to take some of the blame for these uh, recalcitrant mayors. Questions? Yeah, sure. Please identify yourself. Sure. I'm Annie Donovan. I'm with NCB Capital Impact. We're a national organization. Um, a community development financial institution. And we've been practicing social innovation for the 30 years of our history, as a lot of our peer organizations have. And it's really very, very encouraging that the Social Innovation Fund is there and modeling for even for other agencies how to do this. So we're really excited about it. And we're an applicant for the program, but I know you can't say anything mm -hmm. about that. Um, it, um, but what I wanted to ask is, how robust do you think the Social Innovation Fund is going to be? I know you're going to be flooded with a lot of fantastic ideas. And I know, you know we had trouble deciding which one we should go in with. And there are a lot of organizations out there that have been doing really exciting work. Do you, and $50 million is, we all know, is not a lot of money. Um, do you think this has good prospects of uh, getting future appropriations? Um, we did put in for $60 million for next year. And I think, uh, I think for us this year will be a good test case on how well we do with the applications and also getting the money out this year. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're committed to this. We're not, this is not a one-time great idea, check the box, campaign promise delivered. Uh, this is something that we're, we're very committed to and wanting to see succeed because if and how this works will also determine how it works across other agencies and that's pretty critical for us. So um, we're committed. I know the corporation is committed and they've, they've put a lot of effort and time and kind of just even the, the design of the NOFA and the number of comments and thoughtful comments that came in were extremely valuable and they took those comments and actually had very very good discussions on it so um, absolutely the commitment is there from the administration but the commitment's also there from the agency to make this work I'm Stan Wellborn with uh, resources for the future I'm wondering if I could um, ask you to elaborate a bit on uh, something I didn't hear in your comments, which you, you talked a lot about government um, support for innova social innovation and nonprofit foundation support. I didn't hear very much about the private sector and corporate, uh, what, what outreach you're doing to the corporate sector to uh, perhaps expand the, um, the, the, the funding, the limited funding that you have with private sector money. <laughs> well, uh, is it, 
a couple of ways to answer your question. We're kind of negotiating here about how to do this. Um, there is a match uh, that will be important, um, and the private uh, sector in a community can participate in the match. Um, there, there are a couple other ways, to, and Sonal can elaborate on that. There's a couple other ways to answer your question, though, because really what we need to think of is this kind of rippling leverage effect of this fund, right? So you've got a fund, you've got an intermediary, the intermediary makes grants. Each one of those has kind of a match opportunity and has a leverage opportunity. And, you know, the most creative applications will be the ones that have a, 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 a pretty elaborate uh, set of network partners that are in those. And, and so e each of those is an opportunity for corporate participation and change. I think there's another way that uh, uh, c corporations can participate that's less polite to speak about, which is, you know, my business friends who sat on nonprofit boards in Indianapolis, easier to criticize myself than others, um, were uh, to too respectful of, uh, they, they wouldn't bring their demand for performance onto the board of the nonprofit. I think they felt uncomfortable about kind of being judgmental. And so what they, so the, so the, not, the nonprofit lost its opportunity to have a, a capacity building, mission driven <laughs> performance work. And if you look at, um, you know, I, I know New Profit best because they're in Boston. If you look at what New Profit has done in its funding, it has, um, it has examined diligently the business model and then it has gone with those funded social entrepreneurs and helped them develop, insist on performance. It's a long way of saying, I think there's a, if you really want, we'd like to, I'd like to take this fund in five, five or ten cities that want to replicate the process and open up space for social progress in a transformative way in cities that aren't having it, that, that aren't it, you're currently experiencing. That will require an enlightened business community not only to participate in funding, but to demand results and be willing to say, look, our organization is not doing it, and then things can begin to move around. Do you want more on the match? No, I think mm. it's perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'll get up front in a minute. I'm just here. I'm founder of something called the 9-11 uh, Unity Walk, where people of all different faiths come together uh, and go down <laughs> Embassy Row and also service projects. My question is, with respect to grassroots, I mean, we actually do this for $25,000 a, a year. Uh, it could be expanded to other cities, but, but the question is, with respect to grassroots and, and uh, you know, spreading to uh, other areas of the country, how small do you, I guess, is the question? I think both of us want to be a little careful about kind of predicting the outcome of a competitive process. So, um, uh, the I would think conceptually that you uh, that an organization like yours would be part of somebody uh, some intermediary's application, right? Because it's really this this fund is designed to fund intermediaries who then sub grant to other groups, grassroots groups in a community. So I I would think of it like that. Right here. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. My name is Ben Sands. I'm from Water Street Partners. We're a consulting firm that does joint ventures and partnerships. Um, my question, though, is related to something you said, Sonal, about uh, tolerance for ambiguity being prerequisite in or a common characteristic of both Goldman and Google employees as well as successful social entrepreneurs. Um, Stephen, have you done any research into what, you know, what else constitutes or what else characterizes uh, successful social entrepreneurs? Um, and my my instinct is that there's probably some very, you know, uh, capable 30-year-olds, you know, perhaps not the folks that have come right out of Teach for America or another civic group, um, that just need kind of a kick in the pants to start thinking about some sort of social problem uh, and applying some of the, the corporate and private sector skills that they've developed over the last you know, 10 years or so. Yeah, there's a lot of different variety. I mean, you can find... Um, <laughs> A lot of really passionate young folks who want to make a change. They can make a change through, I mean, we, we haven't spent much time, but some can make a change on the demand side by creating tools and a movement, right, um, uh, for change, uh, better educational outcomes, or the like. Um, the, the kick in the pants, though, one kind of confuses me in this regard. The, the folks that I've seen don't need any kick in the pants, right? I mean, they need a little capacity. Some of them are really good at ideas, not so good at you know operations, uh, but but they are they're um, hyperkinetic, passionate, performance-driven folks that, so that need access to resources or access to networks. So, 
Um, uh, so the common theme of success is, a, is an idea and a model that makes a difference and the passion to get it done and, a, and an outcome that you're willing to be judged against. And when those things come together with the resources, then it can work. My thought, though, is that there's a lot of smart young people who just the perceived risk of going out and doing something from a, in a social or not-for-profit environment is significant. And as a result, a lot of good ideas and skills just aren't being applied. Robert Eggers, the founder of DC Central Kitchen, is a good example who said, you know, at some point I just had to go do it and risk, you know, risk aside. So I don't mean to. Well, I mean, if they're worried about risk, uh, a large number of them are going to fail. I mean, honestly. I mean, that's the, that's the definition of a startup. And we have a lot of a lot of nonprofit startups. I was we did this thing with uh, Chris Gergen at Harvard last week, and, he, and I'm going to quote him. I have no idea what this actor is. He, he's a research triangle said there's one nonprofit for every 200 people in the area, right? So they don't lack for nonprofit startups. They just kind of lack for kind of going to scale. So there's a lot of risk involved. But I think that with some of the, I mean, it, it, again, if we thought about this as a network of resources, you don't have to be huge to make a difference. You just have to be part of something that's going to make a difference. And so your part of it can be activated inside these, inside these networks we're discussing. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Rahul Bhandari, Managing Director of Paris Ventures, uh, co-founded incubator at uh, Accenture. It's part of the Billion Dollar Fund, so got a little bit of uh, knowledge on that. And congratulations on your new Thanks. role. Um, so this idea sounds like a funds to funds idea you know, at a high level. Uh, but all these great earth-shaking social ventures are also seeking smart money. And I didn't quite get what else you folks are offering. Um, why would a social venture not go to Steve? And he'd write a check instead of going four months into your process of evaluating. So basically, you know, it filters out and you're going to get second, third tier uh, ventures were not getting funding from anywhere else, so they go to you. And that's not uh, your goal overall. Secondly, I didn't get a sense of what your portfolio is. You know, you've got a $50 million fund, but you're spreading it across HUD, HHS, um, no, not walk exactly. I think for the I nice they're one. different funds. They're different funds in each agency. Like, okay, yeah. so maybe you can give a sense of a portfolio of uh, where your focus is going to be in the next 12 months or 24 months. And the third is ROI. You know, what is your return on the next? Why should you get another sixty million dollars uh, next year? So, um, let me start with your first question, which I think is a good question, and and all of them were. But let's just start with the first one. I don't actually know that that's true. It's that easy to get money if you are a venture, social venture organization. In fact, we hear from a lot of them on a regular basis that there isn't that money out there. If anyone's gone through the philanthropic space, we're moving faster than the philanthropic community is moving in many cases. So the fact that we got the money appropriated, actually not until January, had a draft NOFA put out, draft notice for funding opportunity for comment, which we'd put out publicly in December before even the money was appropriated, closed it and opened it for funding three weeks ago, um, that's moving faster than most foundations will make a decision, which is a year. So if, if it's not that simple to be able to find those networks where someone's just going to go write you a check and find that smart money, that smart money isn't necessarily there. So in essence, we're filling a market gap that currently doesn't ex that gap exists. And that's a real, it's not a perceived market gap, it is a gap. So, and no one's really investing in that middle intermediary structure. Everybody goes directly to an organization and then wants to then go sit on an organization board and expand their program, but not looking at expanding impact of an organization. So are we achieving an outcome, not did we get more people? The ROI generally tends to be, did more people come through the door? Did we service more people, not did more people graduate from high school? Or did more people graduate from college? That's not the ROI we have been looking at. We've been looking at ROIs of the number of people walking through the door. So changing the terms of the debate is what this fund is really beginning to do. And that's what we're trying to get the government to think about, is how do we change the terms of the debate? Because we are, in many cases, we are the largest funder 
when you look at housing and urban development, when you look at education, when you look at, we're a very large funder of, org, of organizations. And you do have an impact in the marketplace. You know, even philanthropic money is not that much money compared to what the, what the government money is. So that's, that's um, one. In terms of what the portfolio looks like, it's defined into four broad areas that we have looked at, which is health, education, um, energy, and economic opportunity. We are going to let the organizations, the intermediaries, come with their portfolios. We're not defining portfolios for them, but they need to send us a portfolio, but with clear metrics of how they're going to measure the outcomes and are they achieving those outcomes. And that's pretty important. Uh, that's an important part of where this fund is. Yes, um, I'm Harriet Stonehill, the director of the Mega School Education Center down the street. And we uh, look at parents as a resource in education and have had a very successful program of across, including Indianapolis, where we get the community to work with the schools and the parents. And what happens is what we find it is funded through various grants or school systems. When the money stops <coughs> coming, it's a three-year grant. It's very hard to keep that program it, on its mission. And I think that that has to be acknowledged in what you award, that there is a continuum line because it can continue about three years after the funding stops on its own. Mayors change, communities change, right. principals change, the newspaper editor changes, all those component parts which were there at the beginning peter out and the good works, you know, just start a dribble. And um, so that's a, a, a very important factor that you keep the energy, the passion, going for these things over the, ini uh, the initial period of time that your program is funded and highlighted and touted. That's a great point. Well, of course, this is the uh, irrational capital theory, right? <laughs> Which will invest, and so when you prove you're successful, we'll take our money out so you can no longer go forward, <laughs> right? And, uh, yeah, well, right, so three years and you're out. Yeah. And, um, and it raises some pretty substantial questions because for the most successful, for, for mo the definition of success in most of these social startups is a government takeout, right? Almost every foundation funds, assuming that the idea works, the government will take it out. So unlike the private sector, right? The government will take it, which, is, which of course is the case because as someone mentioned, the government's so dominant in these funding areas. But the problem is that if, if the, all of the existing funding stays in place irrespective of its accomplishment. And if government's going to be the, the exit strategy, and if government is essentially out mm -hmm. of new money, right, then our fund has to prove a concept powerful enough that some agency in its regular funding stream picks it up. Because one, I mean, one that we can't sustain it. And so th that will be the true test of success. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Smith. I'm with the National Conference on Citizenship, and I had a question about sort of a building a movement around uh, civic entrepreneurship. Uh, so now you had mentioned that uh, many people who go to AmeriCorps are able to learn the skills to, to problem solve in their communities. Many uh, business schools are now starting to teach about social enterprise and more um, uh, moving more towards uh, building nonprofits or um, social enterprise in their, in their communities. My question is about um, how do we build more people with skills to be civic entrepreneurs? Is there a need for a National Institute of Civic Entrepreneurship, or where else can they learn these skills? And let me ask, because uh, uh, Harvard Kennedy School with yourself, David Gergen, uh, Harvard University has been doing a lot of that, and I think there's some new leadership award grants happening. Maybe you could, because that, some of that's in the book too, expand on that. A advocating an institute because Harvard's not doing a good job would not be my professional best interest. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, that's why I was saving you. Thank you, you very much. <laughs> um, uh, I think the problem, and uh, you know, Duke has been a leader in this probably more than almost any, Duke and Stanford and Harvard to some extent. The problem that I see is that it's the uh, integration of the disciplines across these universities that's necessary to create a social entrepreneurship, because so social entrepreneur, we do a great job in the government school, the Kennedy School, of teaching kids to think about public value, right, and, 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 and public service, and, and they're very talented, very smart students. The business school does a really good job of teaching business models and business cases and financial, you know. We don't, at least as far as I can tell, we don't do a very good job in that. 
And so, and, but, but those two may come together to produce a really entrepreneurial approach to education, public health, fill in the blank, and now you've got another school in those categories. So the better schools are those who have, the better efforts and the one that would have to be more powerful as you brought those together. It's kind of a little bit of part of your question too because you have some people who are really passionately committed but don't really have the skill set because they haven't been taught the skill set in order to produce the product. So I think bringing those together in some, in some of the better research centers would be, would be helpful. As opposed to starting what the question was a national Institute for Social Entrepreneurship separately. Well, I'm also so, a mayor, you know, everything I look at is kind of from mayor, and anything that starts with the word national, I'm <laughs> deeply suspicious about. <laughs> right. I, I, and I would, I would only build on that, which is, um, even from a democratic perspective, I don't believe in the national piece on this, but uh, is, is the, I think if we can take a lot of this down to very local levels, either at community colleges, state colleges, where this begins to be taught and new curriculums are taught interdisciplinary, not just it's a, it's a social entrepreneurship group within the u university, but it is you're thinking about infusing this concept within the various aspects, I think it becomes more real because it is about, it is about what happens locally. It's not really what happens nationally. Nationally, we can provide a cover and we can provide the policy guidance and certainly um, the, the bully pulpit, but what the concept of this is that solutions are happening more locally and it's not going to be because the national made it happen. It's because it's happening and we're trying to find them. And if the schools were teaching it at local levels, I think it's much more important. To give a little tout or shout out to the Kennedy School, uh, in terms of thought leading to action, which is what we talk about sometimes at the Aspen Institute, the Kennedy School, when it got interested in Katrina, decided to send and keep a team in New Orleans and picked one neighborhood, Broadmoor, with Doug Ollers, I think Professor Lee, quite a few other people. And it was a steady stream of students and others from the Harvard's Kennedy School who stayed down there and picked that neighborhood, everything from business to education to urban planning, and brought that one neighborhood up. It was a great case study for Harvard, but it was also the savior of one neighborhood in New Orleans. Of course, I mean, you're the moderator, so I, get, I don't know if you're allowed to have opinions, but I mean, it's essentially... <laughs> I have opinions. I don't know if I'm allowed to be the moderator. And you paid for the, you paid for the mic, too. No, no, so. no, no. no uh, but, but, uh, Michael and Steve You Casey. may have another a minute or two story. I mean, if given your position in, uh, in uh, rebuilding uh, New Orleans, and the interesting interplay between government, nonprofits, and faith organizations. I mean, you probably saw <coughs> firsthand some of the special social entrepreneurs at their best and how they both, government both facilitated them and kind of repressed them depending on the circumstance. Yeah, I think that one of the things I learned, which is why I am skeptical of social entrepreneurship on its own, <laughs> is that a thousand people with a thousand different ideas in a difficult situation can be a mess. I'm also skeptical of old line service organizations. I mean, if you wanted to waste your money, you could have given it to the Red Cross or just flush it down the toilet. The Red Cross just didn't come in. There were, though, organizations from Habitat for... What? I'm so sorry I asked. In, in, you're not on the... No. In, in between were organizations like Habitat for Humanity, and if I may say so, Teach for America, or the Kennedy School or others, who said, we can bring people together and channel the energy of people who want to do service. Uh, Michelle uh, Nunn and the, what's, what was it called then? Points of Light, Hands On. They were there and it was hands on at all times. And so people who wanted to be involved, we said, instead of going down and trying to invent an organization that's going to get knapsacks from high school kids around America and donate them to school kids in New Orleans, which, you know, uh, we said, go through the hands-on network of Points of Light or Teach for America or Habitat for Humanity and get started. And then that created spin-offs in New Orleans, like Teach NOLA, which is Teach for New Orleans, or New Schools New Orleans, or uh, various organizations down there. I also think the university should play a larger role the way the Kennedy School at Harvard does. Tulane stepped forward and really made service and social entrepreneurship a key part of reinventing that university. And they took over certain functions in New Orleans when with all due respect, bipartisan uh, uh, 
uh, my criticism from the federal government, Michael Brown at FEMA and the president, on down to the mayor and the governor, were almost paralyzed and had no idea what to do. So, uh, you, you know, that should be, and I perhaps uh, Duke or Harvard or Stanford will pick it up, a case study of where uh, connections did and didn't work. Oh, Don Presley, I'm sorry, yeah, and then behind you, yeah, I'm sorry, I saw Don's hand earlier. Don, by the way, let me tout him, besides, <laughs> he is where business and social entrepreneurship go together with Booz, Booz, Booz Allen Hamilton. Booz Allen Hamilton, I'm sorry, the names change occasionally. <laughs> but Booz Allen and Don personally. Booz, Booz Allen Presley soon. But Booz <laughs> Allen Presley. <laughs> uh, when we wanted to spread social entrepreneurship to the Palestinian territories with our Middle East Strategy Group and our Middle East Investment Initiative, uh, with the help of Michael and the Case Foundation uh, and Gene Case, who was a co-chair with me of the U.S.-Palestinian Partnership, we created a lo small business loan fund and a, um, what was that, business, co uh, this sort of investment conference right. in the Palestinian territories and Booz Allen Hamilton stepped up to actually run it. So with that introduction, Brian. Well, thank you very much, Walter. <laughs> and it, it relates to my question, Sonal. When, uh, when Brian Atwood was at uh, USAID, he actually created a reverse um, assistance idea of bringing ideas from the global marketplace back to America. Is that part of your thinking that uh, you want to reach out more globally than just um, uh, inside the United States? That's a great. That's a great question, and I think um, absolutely. In fact, some of the some of the partnerships we've done, we brought the ideas from globally to domestically because, um, in texting and some other places, the the global ideas have been much more innovative and in how how they've approached that. But it's something that we've been talking to AID about, and also the the National um, Entrepreneurship Summit that the president will be hosting in April is focused on the same idea. Explain the National Entrepreneurship Summit. It's in April 26th. April 26th, April 27th. Um, it's post the, the speech that, that the Cairo. president gave in Cairo. Uh, we talked about entrepreneurship and why it was so important, and it was both business and social entrepreneurship. And that summit will be focused bringing entrepreneurs, and social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs from uh, all over the world to Washington to discuss common issues that we all face on on growing entrepreneurship, what are the issues that need to be addressed that they can work on, that we can work on with them, and also what we're facing together. Oh, yes, sorry. I'm uh, Amy Wilkinson, I'm a scholar okay, at the Woodrow Wilson Center and a fellow at the Kennedy School. Um, so that, I've been... You can do both? I can do both. I can go back and forth, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> so I've been that's doing a no some account, a no accountability content. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's probably right. Um, so I've been doing some research and writing on entrepreneurs across sectors. I've actually interviewed Sono, I'm a big fan. Um, my question is about the mindset of government because business entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs tend to see things the same way, and uh, it it appears from at least the folks I've talked to that it's very difficult at the federal level in government. You talked a little bit about risk. Um, I'm just curious the mindset and and how you bring that into the government. Well, let's start with the easier part first. I think it so we've looked around at the city and state level and it, the same problem exists at the city and state level but you can have a person committed to social change in government who can drive a lot of progress. And a, a friend of mine was a juvenile judge in Indianapolis, now the uh, health, HHS secretary, essentially the child welfare secretary in Indiana, has decided one day that the nonprofits that the government was funding through the 4E program were just not accomplishing anything. They're just doing the same thing over and over again and dramatically changed the process of letting those contracts and everything kind of convulsed around it. So there's a couple other, there's an interesting Kennedy School case study about years old about Oklahoma. It's called Milestone Program where they started paying uh, nonprofits for outcomes for uh, folks with disabilities as contrasted to kind of coaching them along the way. So, so you can find that. Um, Michael Bloomberg has a $200 million fund in the mayor's office uh, uh, to fund innovation. Very exciting example that uh, we're hoping to uh, kind of celebrate across the country. Um, I, th I think the risk at the federal level are pretty serious, and not because of the executive branch alone, because 
you have a legislative branch that's not unimportant in this mix. Uh, and so I hope that the fund can set an example about how to, um, how to make money available in a way that's measured by performance than, and not measured by activities and, and accounting rules. But, uh, and, and I would finally, as someone mentioned a couple times, I think the, the um, you know, I'm a Republican in case you didn't know, but I really think that the process that Secretary Duncan has used for Race to the Top is a very exciting process mm -hmm. in terms of driving change and very encouraging. So there are some, some examples. Like There's, yeah, right there. Uh, my name is Jeff Reed, and I'm building an entrepreneurship program at Georgetown University. And social entrepreneurship, I can tell you, is one of the hottest topics, if not the hottest topic on the entire campus. And Sonal, we appreciate you coming to our uh, Arab Innovators program in the fall. But the, uh, it, it is the yeah, number one topic, I think, that our, our students are interested in at all levels. And it's an opportunity for our university to span the different boundaries and silos between the business school and foreign service and law school, all those kind of things. My question is, uh, is there is that strong interest level amongst the students. They want to do something that's socially innovative. But instead of every one of those students graduating and starting their own nonprofit, which as we have heard, everybody doing their own thing is not always successful, can you use the Innovation Fund or any of the other programs to help uh, identify the organizations that want that talent? So, so to help us as advisors to these students say, here is, a, is an organization, maybe it's a, like a Teach for America or others, essentially that says, here's a career path for you. Because uh, there are these people that want to do it, and we'd love to help identify the right places for them to go. It's a really good idea. What's the name of that guy in uh, memory blank in California uh, who run, who connects uh, business executives to nonprofits? Ah, uh, so, so, no. So, there, so, so, but, Aaron Hurst. Yeah, Aaron Taproot Hurst. Foundation. Taproot. Right. So Taproot. It, I mean, just so the answer is this is a great idea, and I actually hadn't thought about it with respect to the fund, which is to try to create entrepreneurship by uh, finding entrepreneurial folks and connecting them to organizations. Uh, 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 Taproot is not exactly what you meant, but it's an example where um, he had a group of nonprofits that needed capacity, he had a group of kind of booze type employees that wanted to do something, had a little trouble finding the right organization, didn't want to be too patronizing or solicitous to the organizations. There was a lot of kind of and so they essentially connected that and created a reservoir of capacity. We could do that um, better connecting to college campuses as well. It would be a good idea. Thank you all very much. The book is The Power of Social Innovation, and The Power of Social Innovation is also embodied by Sonal Shaw. Uh, you can get the book out there. You can continue the conversation over dessert and coffee. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for the question.